worship the living God. Amen. It's wonderful to worship the living God. I was just, uh, you were telling us how you wrote that song, right? Sure. And I still sang. Uh, the title of today's message is uh, Becoming Fruitful Through Affliction. Amen. Becoming Fruitful Through Affliction. And uh, just it's just one verse that I'd like all like all of you to turn to. That's Genesis 41, verse 52. Genesis 41, verse 52. It goes like this: the name of the second son. He called Ephraim, for God has caused me to be fruitful in the land of my affliction. Now these words are the words of Joseph. And Joseph, uh, as we all know, was uh, betrayed by his brothers, sold as a slave, lost everything. And this man, this man, of course, with the passage of time, he's saying, he's naming his second son, Ephraim. And he says, this is what Ephraim means. For God has made me fruitful in the land of my affliction. I often wonder, as a believer, how easy is it for me to say this that God has made me has caused me to be fruitful in the land of my affliction very often uh, I'm not in a position to say it you know, because I'm thinking that God still has to do this still has to do that uh, yeah, and this is what Joseph says and we all know the story of Joseph we all know the story of Joseph it's a it's an amazing story. So uh, as I said, it, it, this is this has also been described as the kind of story that dreams are built on. You know, you listen to Joseph's story. Sold as a slave, he's lost everything, and he becomes the prime minister of the most powerful nation in the world. <laughs> Can we even begin to understand something like that? A boy who has lost everything, his family, his loved ones, the love of his family. His position in the family, his freedom, he's lost everything. And he becomes the prime minister of the most powerful nation in the world. And uh, we don't know the exact time when he sent this, but the, he names his second son Ephraim because that's a testimony to what God has done for him. For God has caused me to be fruitful in the land of my affliction. Because Egypt is a land in into which he was sold as a slave, right? He was sold as a slave into Egypt and he becomes the Prime Minister of that land. Uh, now, like I said, well, these lines are really powerful. Uh, you know, he, lo he lost his family and his freedom at the age of 17. <laughs> he lost his family and his freedom at the age of 17. And yet, he went on to become the Prime Minister, as I said. Of course, this didn't happen overnight. It, it didn't happen over, overnight. There were a lot of uh, twists and turns in his career. Ups and downs, twists and turns. But through it all, he continued to trust in Almighty God. Through all the twists and the turns, he continued to trust in Almighty God. And God blessed him in an unimaginable way. God blessed him in an amazing way. And uh, he, uh, <coughs> Pharaoh gives him a wife and he has two children. This is what he names his second son, Ephraim, which means God has blessed me in the land of my affliction. Okay. Uh, <coughs> Now, we're going to look at uh, how 
Joseph became fruitful. Amen. What the affliction was and how he became fruitful. Uh, so, you know, we're looking at Joseph between the ages of 17 and uh, 30. 17 and 30. Because he was uh, betrayed by his brothers around that age, 17. And uh, between the ages of 17 and 30. And God made him fruitful at every stage. You know, when you look at the fruitfulness of Joseph, it was not only when he became the pharaoh. It was not only when he became the prime minister of Egypt. It was at every stage in his life. Hallelujah. As a slave. Amen. As a slave. Yes. As a servant. Yes. As a prisoner. Yes. And just to look at it, you know, these are not uh, prestigious situations. Only the last position is a prestigious position. None of the others were prestigious. Nothing to write home about. Nothing to tell anybody about. But God made him fruitful in all those stages. In all those stages. Uh, he becomes uh, Pharaoh's uh, top executive. He becomes the highest civil servant in Egypt. He becomes the prime minister of Egypt. Amen. So God was with him. God was with him in every stage of the way. So now, when we are going through afflictions, uh, when I am going through afflictions, the first thought that crosses my mind is, God doesn't care for me. God has forgotten about me. right? But not even once, not even once do we see Joseph thinking along those lines. Whatever happens, he sees the hand of God in it. You know, that's the only way that we can live through afflictions. Whatever happens, see the hand of God in it. Whatever happens. We don't understand what's happening, but we need to rest in the assurance that God understands what ha what's happening. And God has a plan. Even if we don't see the plan, God has a plan. So we, I need to train myself to think like that. I need to train myself to think like that. Because uh, the perfect time, God does everything at the perfect time. You know, we, we know that uh, God is never early. And just like that, God is never late. God is never early. We're always anxious. We're worried because God is not doing things on my timetable. God is not early. But God is never late. God's time is perfect. God's time is perfect. And uh, Joseph could see that. Joseph could think like that. He was waiting for God's perfect time. Uh, so the same God who worked in Joseph's life, Joseph's life is wants to work in our life. The same God who works in, worked in Joseph's life wants to work in our life. And he's working for that perfect time. He's waiting for that perfect time. He wants us to grow. He wants us to grow. You know, that's the purpose why God wants us. He's waiting for the perfect time. Because that time is perfect from in the light of eternity. You know, God's uh, timing is so perfect that it is perfect in the light of eternity. It's not perfect in in the brief duration of my little life. God's, when God does something, He does it in the light of eternity. And He wants us to grow. He wants us to grow. Because if we haven't grown enough, you know, sometimes we can even enjoy the gift so much that we forget all about the giver. That happens to us. It's happened to me so many times. Right? You enjoy the gift so much that you forget all about the gift. So we are like that. We are like that. Okay. Now, getting back to Joseph. At 17, this is what happens. You know, he is betrayed by his brothers. So, first of all, we see the fruitfulness in Joseph's life when the way he handles rejection you know rejection is a very difficult thing to handle right very very difficult why 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 me why me you know rejection is a very very difficult thing to handle. we keep on uh, 
justifying to ourselves and explaining to ourselves, you know, we accepting rejection is very, very good. And who was uh, Joseph rejected by? His own siblings. His own siblings. And you can imagine, uh, he is the, uh, yeah, he's the, 11th son, right? He's not the 12th. Benjamin was born after that. So he's the 11th son. So when he was born, he had 10 elder brothers, and all these elder brothers are supposed to protect him and guide him and love him. And they are the ones who betray him. So the way he handled rejection. So he was not looking at what his brothers had done, he was looking at what God had done. That's the only way Joseph could think. God is in charge of my life. Whatever happens, it is God who is acting. It is God's hand. It is God's work. This has nothing to do with what my brothers are doing. It doesn't matter what my brothers think or what my brothers want. God. This is what God is doing. That's how Joseph, that's what he believed. So God made him fruitful through rejection. And, uh, you know, sometimes you go through rejection and... Uh, we, uh, you know, we say that I have I've cried so much that I have no more tears to cry. But I've exhausted all the tears. I'm so upset. I'm, I've thought so much about it. I've, uh, I, I just can't make sense of it. Because why is that happening? Because I'm looking at, I'm thinking why that person rejected me. But what, as a Christian, what should I be thinking about? I should be thinking about what God is doing. What the person has done or what the person has said does not matter. All I need to think about is what God is doing. That's the only way I can get go through with it. And uh, so God can make us fruitful like Joseph. And uh, the fruitfulness of Joseph. You know, Joseph was, a, he was just a shepherd boy, right? Yeah. He belonged to a family of uh, shepherds. They were sheep herders that's all he had and what was God doing God was outfitting him God was equipping him to become the Prime Minister of Egypt but did he know that at the time no he didn't he did not know that at the time but at that time through the prison through the betrayal God was trained through the rejection God was Training him, outfitting him, equipping him to become the prime minister. Of course, he didn't think he didn't know that. He couldn't even think of that. He didn't know what was going to happen in the future. But he trusted God. He says, even if I don't understand, it does not matter because God has a perfect plan. So, because you know, very often that's all we can look at. We can only look at God and know that He has a perfect. We won't be able to understand and absorb the whole truth because our minds are so small. The 17 year old boy, could he think that uh, you're going to be, I'm going to become the Prime Minister of Egypt? I don't know, that kind of thing is not going to happen. Not going to happen. So we, he was just too small. Our minds are too small to understand what God is going to do. So we need to understand. What, when people reject us, it does not matter. Because God has a plan. God has a plan. And, uh, you know, we have, uh, so God can teach us valuable lessons and enhance our skills through rejection. When we depend more and more on Him, He is polishing us, He's working on us, He's making something of us. You know, David uh, is another man who knew how to handle rejection. You know, just like Joseph, David's another man who knew how to handle rejection. You know, we, uh, you know, in Samuel 23, when David is fleeing for his life from Saul, and uh, he, uh, he, he's, he has taken refuge in the, in the city of uh, Kela, in the city of Kela, and uh, he knows that Saul is following him. Uh, and he asks God, can I stay here or should I go? Will these people protect me or will they give me up to Saul? And uh, God tells him, these people are going to give you up. And you know, he, he has actually 
protected these people. He has saved these people before. He has saved these people. And he cannot believe it. And so he asks God again. And God tells him again, yeah, they're going to give you up. When Saul comes and asks for you, they're going to give you up. And so he does what is necessary and he leaves the place. So, you know, even Saul, you know, we know all about Saul. When Saul was king, when Saul was king, David, this little boy, David, when Samuel comes to his home, he is busy taking care of the sheep, right? All his brothers are ready to, uh, you know, they're, they're approaching uh, Samuel in the hope that, oh, Samuel is going to choose me. Samuel is going to pick me. And uh, little David is taking care of the sheep. And finally, all the brothers, Samuel looks at all the brothers and he says, no, these, none, of these, none of these are wanted by God. And then you have one more son, where is he? That's when they remember that this little guy is out in the fields taking care of the sheep, of the goats. And they call him. And that is when Samuel anoints him and says, tells him, you are going to be the next king of Israel. But this man, David knows all that. He knows all that. And yet, he knows all that. You know, he has been blessed by Samuel. Samuel has told him that God has rejected Saul and he has accepted you to be the next king. He knows all that. And you know, when he's fleeing for his life, he's fleeing for his life because Saul is pursuing him, trying to kill him. And once he comes, you know, Saul is, uh, falls asleep in a cave and David and his men are hiding in that cave, right? And Saul is in his hands. He can easily kill him. He can easily kill him. And he is only killing the man who is trying to kill him. Imagine, you know, he's not killing an innocent man. He's only killing the man who is trying to kill him. And his soldiers even tell him, go on, do it. And David says, no, I'm not going to do it. Because I'm going to wait for God's time. Hallelujah. I'm going to wait for God's time. Just look at that situation. You're, 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 you're praying to God for something and it's not happening and you're thinking, why, why, why? Look at David. Saul, you know, a lesser man could think that it is God who put him here. It's God who put Saul into my hands. Well, I'll kill him. And I've been anointed as the next king. You know, just, just look at that, you know, just look at that. I've been anointed as the next king and here the, the man was trying to kill me. He's lying there helpless. God only brought him here. Yeah, God brought him here. Any, anyone would have explained that only in that way. But he says, no. Amen. I'll only do it in God's time. So I'm just thinking, how, uh, how much, you know, this is what God teaches us. This is what God teaches us. And uh, so God's timing, God's timing. So the importance of uh, waiting for God's timing. To wait on God. That's what God was teaching Joseph. That's what he was teaching Joseph. To wait, to wait. All this, all this, you know, all this time as a slave in a, I mean, as a prison. God was teaching me to wait, 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 wait for me. Okay. And uh, the next, uh, we see Joseph, the next, uh, tri the next trial he goes through is uh, false accusation. And you know, we know that uh, God is blessing Joseph because uh, he's, uh, he's becomes, uh, he becomes a worker, a slave in, in Potiphar's palace, in Potiphar's house. And uh, he does his work so well that Potiphar is so impressed by it. Just imagine, you know, he's a, he's a slave and Potiphar is so impressed by him that he entrusts everything to him a slave and he entrusts everything to him this is the favor of god you know even though he's a slave because he was faithful god's favor was on him so god's favor as i said before is not something that comes one fine day it's there in the moment it's there in the moment as a slave god's favor was on him because he was and potiphar entrusts him with everything and that's when the next problem starts. His wife sees Joseph and uh, she, she has ideas. She makes plans and uh, she tries to seduce him. Of course, Joseph will have nothing to do with it. He'll have nothing to do with it. And finally, you know, 
she she feels like an idiot she feels so stupid because all her feminine wiles have been wasted on this slave she could attract any man in egypt and she is you know she wanted the slave and he has rejected her his rejector and so she wreaks havoc on him what does she do she accuses him of trying to rape her right and uh, and of course uh, part of her uh, i don't know whether he actually be his wife but in here he has to keep up appearances so he throws joseph into prison he throws joseph into prison not killed him no <laughs> yeah you know so you know he's been married to this woman for some time so he knows how things are and so he just throws him to prison because and uh, so joseph <coughs> he's done a good job he was blessed by god he was honored by potiphar but now he gets thrown into prison he gets thrown into prison <coughs> so and he becomes fruitful through false accusations so the first fruitfulness came through rejection the second fruitfulness came through false yes. accusation and imprisonment he was thrown into prison he was thrown into prison and in prison is uh, do we see joseph uh, indulging in self pity and uh, crying for himself and be feeling sorry for himself no. even there joseph said, tells himself god has a purpose but he doesn't care whether he's in a prison or he's in a palace God has a plan for him. So he was a favorite son. At one time he was a favorite son, remember? And then he became a uh, the the favorite employee, Potiphar's favorite employee. And now he's thrown in prison. And what happens in prison? He becomes a uh, the favored prisoner because the the guy in charge of the prison sees something in Joseph. He sees something that he's never seen anywhere else. and he elevates him he elevates him he honors him so even in prison even in prison joseph is honored joseph is honored so even through when false accusation even there joseph only he did not think i am innocent i i i did not because i am innocent this happened to me because i stood for the truth this happened to me because i honored god this happened to me no you don't see him doing that he said god has a purpose god has a plan god has a wonderful purpose that's it you know because when he was 17 years old god god started training him and god, he joseph knows he has a purpose he has a purpose he has a wonderful purpose uh and uh, so he found favor with the prison warden and he was made chief administrator for the management of all prison operations so the prisoner becomes a prison administrator yeah. the prisoner becomes a prison administrator <laughs> just imagine this is what happens when he or faith when joseph was faith and uh, so his status changes once again so he was first he was favorite son he became favorite slave he became potiphar's favorite executive and now he is the favored prisoner the favorite prisoner so and uh, so the next we see that uh, the pharaoh's cupbearer and baker they're imprisoned because of something or the other and uh, they come to know joseph because joseph is in charge of the prison <laughs> he's running the place now and uh, they tell him what happens and uh, what's going to happen and joseph tells both of them exactly what is going to happen to them both so what happened uh the cup bearer was restored to his position and the baker was executed just as joseph told them just as joseph told him and uh, so had i been in that position and the baker has been restored to his position i would have thought ah okay now you tell the pharaoh and now my 
my power will know about me and all my problems are going to end. No, that didn't happen. That didn't happen. Because uh, he forgot all about Joseph. You know, he was saved. He was told, Joseph told him exactly what is going to happen. Because God spoke to him. But he did not even have the basic decency to remember Joseph. And Joseph could have uh, gotten very, very upset at that time. But even then, Joseph was thinking, if he's forgotten about me, God has a purpose. God has a purpose. God has a purpose. Has a purpose. And uh, two years, two years passed. Two years, Joseph, after sending the cupbearer back to Pharaoh's family, Joseph is still in prison. <coughs> Two years and uh, and then God's time came when it was God's time what happened the most important man in the whole of Egypt saw a terrible dream and he couldn't get an explanation for it because God you know the most important man so God doesn't need to work through a baker he walks through the Pharaoh of Egypt Amen. the king of Egypt the king of Egypt saw this dream and none of his advisors and uh, uh, you know all these uh, magic guys with him, none of them could help them. And that is when the baker remembers, oh, two years ago this is what happened. This is what happened. So this happened in God's perfect time. You know why? Because God is waiting for the perfect time. God is waiting for the perfect time. And we, our understanding of the word perfect and God's understanding of the word perfect are two completely different things. Ours is a very limited understanding. Very Amen. limited. But God's is perfect in the light of eternity. Right? Perfect in the light of eternity. So in God's perfect time, the most powerful man in the world saw dreams and his wise men couldn't interpret his dreams. And that is when the baker remembers Jews. Okay. Now, you know, just look at this. You know, we often talk of uh, having good contacts. You know, we often say that if you want to progress, if you want to develop, if you want to uh, make, if you want to progress in life, you need to have the right contacts. You need to have good contacts. And through good contacts, you know, so and so will talk to so and so, and so and so and so and so. And that's how things will work out for us. But uh, in the case of Joseph, nothing. God worked through Pharaoh, the most important man in Egypt. That's how who go. God worked, and Pharaoh couldn't understand his dream, what his dream was, and that is how the baker remembered Joseph. That's how the baker remembered Joseph. He told Pharaoh about it. And uh, Joseph is brought before Pharaoh. Pharaoh tells him the dream and Joseph gives him God's explanation. God's explanation. In God's perfect time. And that is when Joseph is elevated. He is Amen. elevated. That is the highest. That's when he becomes the prime minister of Egypt. Until then he was the he was a slave. He was a prisoner. Nothing great. Nothing wonderful. It's only at the very last stage of his life that he became, he got to a really enviable position. Until then, he was never in an enviable position. So until then, for 14 years or for 17 years, he was faithful in unenviable positions. He was faithful in unenviable positions. So he reaches, he reaches the enviable position after all these years. So through the through these afflictions of being rejected, of being forgotten, rejection, being forgotten, being falsely accused. To rejection here. Yeah. That's how he becomes faithful. That's how he becomes faithful. And he becomes faithful through being forgotten as well. Now, uh, so once again, his status changes, right? Favorite son to favorite slave to favorite executive to favorite prisoner. And now 
to your favorite diplomat or favorite prime minister. That's what he becomes. Okay, now, like I said, Joseph was a shepherd boy. So where did he get the skill to take on this position as the Prime Minister of Egypt, as providing food, this position of being able to provide food for the whole world, not just for Egypt, for the whole of the known world. He was able in a position to provide food for all of them. And where did he get this? He get got, he learned to do this through his trials. He learned to do this through his tribulations, through his problems. That's how he learned to do this. So, uh, you know, in uh, Genesis 50, 12, Genesis 50, 12, Joseph tells his brothers, you intended to harm me, but God intended it for good to accomplish what is now being done, the saving of many lives. That's what he tells his brother, you know, you intended it to harm me, but God intended it for me. And that is ongoing, you know, even now, he's still saving lives, he's still saving lives. So this is uh, this is what God can do for you and for me. He can make us fruitful through our afflictions. He can make us fruitful through our afflictions. So God has a purpose in giving us afflictions. He can make us fruitful through our afflictions. So Joseph led a life of favor even through the most trying circumstances that the world could throw at him. You know, the, whole, the most trying circumstances. He was rejected by his own brothers, betrayed by them, tricked by them, sold as a slave, lost his freedom. You know, we, we, we can't even imagine that kind of thing. He went through all that and yet he remained faithful. That is why he was faithful. So, so each of us, you know, when we go through these difficult situations, do we get crushed under them? Because that is not God's plan. God's plan is that we use these difficult situations as a springboard to leap towards Him. A springboard. You know, when people do this uh, triple jump, you launch yourself off that board. So that's why God gives us problems in our life so that we can use them as a springboard to grow closer to them. Because the ultimate thing that matters in this world is our relationship with God. Nothing else matters. To Him and to us, what is most important is the relationship. You all know that Christianity is not a religion but a relationship. It's a relationship. So, you know, as Christians, because uh, that's what that's all that uh, God that's all that Joseph did he was faithful he remained faithful to God he remained faithful. and uh, so even through the most trying circumstances the world could throw at him uh, he remained faithful to God that's all Joseph did God did all the rest all the rest raising him from slave to prime minister was all done by God Joseph only did one thing that was Remain faithful. That's all he did. That's all he did. And uh, now let's face it, you know, as Christians, we live in a fallen world with a fallen nature, but we have a risen Savior. Amen. <laughs> we live in a fallen world and we have a fallen nature, but we have a risen Savior. And God gives us adversity to build us up and not to tear us down. Satan wants to tear us down. Satan uses that adversity to tear us down. But Satan did not give us the adversity in the first place. It was God who gave it to us. And the purpose of it is to build us up. To build us up. So what Joseph achieved is what God expects each one of us to achieve in our life. What Joseph achieved in his life is what God expects each one of us to achieve in our life. With every adversity that hits us, God is telling us, what's He telling us? Whenever we are hit by an adversity, God is telling us that uh, He wants to make us better in this world and greater in the next. 
That's what, when He gives us adversity, that's what He's telling us. He wants to make us better in this world and greater in the next. That's why He's giving us adversity. So Genesis 5.20, 50.20, that is God, you meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. That is true for each one of us, only if we believe in Him and listen. Okay, now, what am I saying in my life? What I'm saying is that I should stand in faith. I should stand in faith. Because faith is only the 1% that God wants is my faith. He will do the 99%. All He wants is the 1% of my faith. Faith. The 99% is what He does. And He will do it. Now this is not a 50-50. Often you know, in Malayalam we say, Thang Padi, Devam Padi. Right? We've all heard that, right? Absolute nonsense. That is the theology of the world. It's the theology of the world. Tan Pavadi, Devam Pavadi, 50-50. That's the theology of the world. For the Christian, we just need to do 1%. And what is that? Believe. Believe implicitly. And God will do 99% of what we need. 